Good evening. I'm Greg Sadhoff, Chair of the History and Intellectual Programming Committee of the Colonnade Club here at the University of Virginia. 46 years ago on this day, the United States began its evacuation of Saigon. And those of us who were alive in 1975 at the time recall the famous photograph of the long line of Vietnamese who clamored to get into the helicopter sitting atop the United States Embassy. Now, whether the upcoming withdrawal from Afghanistan produces another Pulitzer Prize winning photo is hard to know. But I do know that Peter Bergen will be there in Afghanistan, either in body or spirit, when the US military departs. Peter has long known Afghanistan as he was the first American journalist to meet with Os Osama bin Laden in the cave in Tora Bora back in 1997. Peter knows photography and has produced award-winning documentaries, but he's also a man of words. After attaining his undergraduate degree in modern history from Oxford, Peter went on to be an acclaimed writer and journalist. In addition to this day as the anniversary of one of the most famous wartime photos of the 20th century, this is also an important anniversary for the English language. Because on this date in 1852, another Peter, Peter Roger, first published Roger's Thesaurus. In addition to his work as a journalist and documentary producer, Peter is Vice President for Global Studies and Fellows at New America. He's CNN's National Security Analyst, Professor of Practice at Arizona State University, where he co-directs the Center for Future of War, and the author or editor of eight books, three of which were named New York Times bestsellers and four of which were named among the best nonfiction books of the year by the Washington Post. Documentaries based on his books have been nominated for two Emmys and also he won an Emmy for best documentary. Peter Bergen is New American's director of the International Security and Future of Wars programs. He serves as the edit on the editorial board of studies in conflict and terrorism, which is a leading scholarly journal in the field and he's testified on Capitol Hill 18 times about national security issues. Peter has held teaching positions at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And for many years, he was a contributing editor both at Foreign Policy and the New Republic, as well as a fellow at New York University's Center on Law and Security. As a member of a band of brothers who work in dangerous international neighborhoods, Peter is the chairman of the board of the Global Special Operations Foundation, which is a nonprofit advocating for the interests of special operations forces. And he's also on the board of the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation, which advocates for Americans who are being held hostage and for journalists in conflict zones. He's written so many books. In 2012, he published Manhunt, the 10 year search for bin Laden from 9 11 to Abbottabad. It won the Overseas Press Club Award for the best book on international affairs. HBO based the film Manhunt on the book, which then won the 2013 Emmy for best documentary. In addition to many subsequent award-winning books, Peter has hosted, produced, or executive produced multiple documentaries for HBO, CNN, National Geographic, and Discovery. And as I mentioned, Peter produced the first television interview with Osama bin Laden in 1997. That interview, which aired on CNN, marked the first time that bin Laden declared war against the United States to a Western audience. During his presentation tonight, please send your questions via the Q&A function on this web platform. Following Peter's remarks, the Colonnade Club's past president, Jan Balmer, will pose as many of those questions as possible. And if not every question can be answered, I'm happy to remind you that Peter will be returning in August for another special presentation for the Colonnade Club. That time to discuss his experience interviewing Osama bin Laden as we will be on the cusp of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Thank you for joining us this evening. This is an anniversary of a famous wartime photograph as well as an essential guide for writers who aspire to have the literary, to the literary success that Peter has enjoyed. The topic for tonight though, is his 2019 book, Trump and his Generals, The Cost of Chaos. 
We look forward to his insights based upon the exhaustive research that he conducted in writing this book. Peter, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Greg, very much for that introduction. And uh, thank you, Jan, and thank you to the Colonnade Club for this invitation and uh, Puneet for making this happen from a logistical point of view. So the book is Trump and his generals, The Cost of Chaos. And the book is gonna be a very unsatisfactory read if you decide to read it. Uh, if you're either a Trump hater or a Trump fan, and since, uh, and since the world is pretty evenly divided between people who have very strong feelings on either side of this equation, uh, the book is, uh, <clears throat> you know, doesn't really fall into the, uh, say, the Victor Davis Hanson uh, kind of school of everything that Trump did was great, or the John Bolton school of, you know, everything that Trump did was pretty much wrong and he was a terrible human being. Interestingly, of course, the only person who has written a book uh, that sort of deals with this uh, period uh, who was an insider uh, that really tried to take a, I think a very measured position was H.R. McMaster's book, Battlegrounds, which uh, is a very interesting read and doesn't really, it's not a tell-all book uh, about the time in the administration. Of course, H.R. McMaster is a key figure in, in, in my book. And then of course, there's also Jim Mattis's book, but that, that book is really more a biography of Mattis's life. And, and it's very interesting because that book uh, went out of its way, and also during the book tour, Jim Mattis went out of his way not to criticize President Trump on the basis that he was a sitting president and that he felt that it was inappropriate. Now, of course, that would change, and I'll get back to that issue uh, towards the end of my, of my talk. Um, but when Greg and I talked about this, uh, he suggested I talk a little bit about methodology and how I came to, to, came to this book. You know, I, initially I was very interested in the fight against ISIS, which, um, you know, uh, and that's the sort of way that I got into this book. Um, and, and as I sort of started thinking about it, I thought maybe a broader book about the Trump foreign policy, national security would be, would be interesting. And, and the reason that I felt that I could pull that off is um, I knew quite a lot of people in the administration. Um, yeah, some of my some, some friends of mine uh, worked in pretty senior positions for Trump. Um, and then uh, beyond all that, um, you know, I felt that it was going to be a, a presidency that, um, you know, was going to be consequential. Um, and, you know, some of the topics that I looked at, uh, one of them, of course, was Afghanistan. And perhaps I can drill down a little bit on that, because Afghanistan was really kind of a test case between the America First group uh, led by Steve Bannon, who of course was uh, President Trump's chief strategist in the first uh, eight months of the administration, and a very influential figure. And on the other side, H.R. McMaster, who took over as national security advisor from Mike Flynn, who only served uh, 22 days in office, who was of course the first national security advisor. Um, and it was a knockdown, drag out fight, I would say, between these two camps. One, the so called globalist camp uh, led by H.R. McMaster, and one, the America First camp led by Steve Bannon. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, there were, there were multiple meetings uh, at the White House. And on the table, there were a, a series of options, one of which was produced by Eric Prince, of course. Who could be, chairman of what used to be called Blackwater and has gone through various incarnations and different names. But Prince, who actually, uh, Pr uh, Prince produced a document which was a pretty accurate summation of all the issues that uh, had gone wrong in Afghanistan. I think he had a, a, good, a good analysis of, of what the problems were. The question was, was his the right solution? His solution was that we should hire former um, special forces, American special forces, but also rather crucially special forces from other countries who had experience in Afghanistan and send them back to particular areas in Afghanistan uh, that they had experience in and kind of rotate them in and out. Um, yeah, and on some levels, that was a, an okay idea. The, the pro there were several problems with it, however. One was uh, it, it would involve non-US nationals because it would involve, uh, and that, that you know, the Pentagon was not gonna go for that. Um, secondarily, it would have involved uh, contractors being involved in operations that could kill people. Uh, and, you know, the, US, the, the Pentagon felt pretty strongly, uh, Jim Mattis, 
and H.R. McMaster, they didn't want contractors being involved in, it's one thing to have contractors involved in, say, intelligence analysis or base security or for, you know, force protection or that kind of thing, but to have contractors uh, actually out in the field um, killing people raised serious issues. Uh, and one of the solutions that Steve Bannon and, and Eric Prince came up with is, okay, if the Pentagon doesn't really like this, we'll hand it over to the CIA and it will be a, a covert operation. Um, and it turned out that Mike Pompeo was, you know, persuaded by people at the agency. They didn't really want to take this on either. They didn't want to suddenly own the war. Uh, and there were a series of pretty contentious meetings. Um, and over time, uh, I think the argument, President Trump bought the argument that uh, having a certain number of troops in Afghanistan uh, was a form of insurance policy. And um, at that time, at the beginning of the Trump administration, there were 10,000 troops. H.R. McMaster argued for a larger number of troops. Uh, the number went up to around 14,000. And what, what's interesting about this whole uh, discussion is President Obama and President Trump and President Biden have all gone through the same process on Afghanistan. President Obama wanted to leave Afghanistan. And in 2015 and 2016, he had a series of meetings uh, that were also pretty contentious, not quite as contentious as the ones during the Trump administration, but certainly um, you know, President Obama wanted to, go, wanted to go down to zero. He had promised an, on December 1st, 2009 at West Point uh, that when he authorized the surge of 30,000 troops into Afghanistan, that, uh, that, that they would start coming out 18 months later. So fast forward to 2015, he was really looking to kind of turn the page on Afghanistan. And he and Susan Rice, who was then the National Security Advisor, had a series of meetings. And ultimately they concluded that, uh, you know, the only thing worse than uh, staying in Afghanistan was simply leaving it. And everybody had the example, the recent example of what had happened in Iraq, where the United States pulled out in December of 2011, which was uh, uh, essentially negotiated by Tony Blinken and uh, then Vice President Joe Biden. Um, and, you know, ISIS came roaring back and took over much of the country in the summer of 2014. So uh, there was a concern in the White House that not to do this in Afghanistan. So President Obama went through this whole discussion himself. And in the end, he left 8,400 troops in Afghanistan uh, when Trump came into office, and that number went up to 14,000. Now, President Trump, of course, on the campaign trail, had repeatedly said that he we spent $6 trillion on these endless wars and they were stupid. At one point he even uh, said in the presence of John Kelly, his chief of staff, um, that, um, you know, the, uh, there wasn't a single, you know, the, the, no death of an American soldier was worth, uh, you know, being in Afghanistan, which was kind of a probably a quite insensitive thing to say since John Kelly's son uh, was killed in 2010 by a roadside IED in Southern Afghanistan something either Trump didn't know about his own chief of staff or just had forgotten or didn't care about. Uh, but the point is, is that Obama, Trump and, and Biden, once you get past the rhetoric, uh, mostly have the sort of same view about Afghanistan, which is, and also the sort of the so-called forever wars, which is we should get out. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, Trump was persuaded uh, to, he gave a speech uh, in August of 2000, in 17, so, uh, sorry, he gave a speech in August in his, during his first year in, in office in which he announced that there would be a, a larger presence in Afghanistan, that we, would, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have a time-based withdrawal, we'd have a conditions-based withdrawal. And I think it was kind of a pretty sensible approach to the Afghan issue. Over time, he changed and uh, he started talking about withdrawal. At one point, very right towards the end of his administration, he said we'd have all troops have Afghanistan by Christmas. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, there were 2,500 troops, really 3,500 once you added in uh, sort of uh, special operations forces who weren't in that camp. And then of course you have Joe Biden coming in saying we're gonna pull out by the end of, uh, by, by September 11th of this year, uh, which I think is a crazy uh, policy because um, there have been no American combat deaths for over a year in Afghanistan. By contrast, there have been 58 uh, fatalities in the U.S. Army uh, of in, in, in accidents. Uh, so the Afghan and, and we're not spending a very large amount of money in Afghanistan right now, uh, with only 2,500 troops. 
or 3,500 at the max. Uh, and yet now we're sort of inexplicably just going to pull the plug. And we're, I think it's going to be, you know, Dr. Sadoff mentioned Saigon at the beginning of this. There's going to be a huge wave of uh, people who the Taliban will want to kill. Um, I think it's wishful thinking of the first order to think the Taliban have changed their views on many issues. And if, don't take my word for it. If you look at the most recent United Nations report put out by the Special Rapporteur on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, uh, they, they talk about the close links that remain between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. The Taliban have told Al-Qaeda, you know, we're going to honor our historic commitments to you. Don't worry about these peace negotiations. Um, and, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda has pledged allegiance to the current leadership of the Taliban. Uh, and so, you know, we've set the stage for a predictable disaster, I think, in, in Afghanistan, where you know, probably within the Biden, uh, you know, this is, this is not going to take, it won't take six months, but it might, it might be two years where you see the Taliban kind of rolling into Afghan cities and many jihadi groups coming into Afghanistan, not simply just Al Qaeda, but other groups like it. Of course, you also have ISIS. So, but what is interesting to me is the commonality between Biden, uh, Trump and Obama on this issue uh, of, of Afghanistan. And there are other commonalities once you also get past some of the rhetoric which is, you know, there's kind of a playbook in the war on terrorism that began with President George W. Bush towards the end of his second term, which was really ramping up the drone program, which caused Obama ramped up even further. Uh, there were 122 drone strikes in Pakistan in 2010 under President Obama, which is the largest number of drone strikes uh, in Pakistan. Uh, uh, that number, you know, it's now close, it's gone out of zero actually under President Trump and President Biden has suspended the drone program uh, for, the, for, for a period. But the, the overall point is that all of these presidents, uh, Biden, Obama and Trump, have come to a kind of, um, I'd, I'd say, a, just a general understanding, which is shared by both sides of the aisle, the national security establishment in Washington, which is the way to deal with jihadi terrorist groups is through cyber warfare, uh, through targeted drone strikes, and through the use of US special operations uh, for counterterrorism operations and the use of US special forces for the advise and assist missions uh, to kind of essentially stand up uh, the um, you know, local forces capable of at attacking these groups. And which brings me to my next kind of bucket of issues under President Trump, which is ISIS. And I you know, if you can't, if you go back to the um, the election between Hillary Clinton and, 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 and Donald Trump, terrorism was a big issue. You, we, we've have put it in the rearview mirror now because of all the other issues that have arisen, of course, COVID being the most important. But um, at the time, you know, ISIS had taken over territory the size of Portugal uh, in 2014. Uh, they controlled uh, citizens, 8 million citizens of the population of Bulgaria. Uh, they were you know, running an insurgent army, they were taxing people, they were extorting people, they were kidnapping people, they were uh, drilling for oil, they were uh, selling antiquities, they, had a, they called themselves the Islamic State, and they behaved to some degree like the state, they even issued driving uh, licenses. Um, and so when Obama, uh, this came on his watch, and obviously he had set the conditions for it in the sense by not leaving any American soldiers in Iraq at the end of 2011. And you, there's a not debate about whether you know, that would have flown with the Iraqis. The point is we didn't really push the issue at all. We could have put a, kept, I think, a larger group of people there um, under the basis of embassy security or other issues. In fact, Jim Mattis, who was the commander of CENTCOM at the time, advocated for leaving 20,000 troops. Well, in the end, of course, we went back into Iraq and there were about 5,000 uh, US troops in Iraq. And pro I, I don't know the exact number now, but it's you know, not, not dissimilar. Um, and we had to fight another war there. Um, but the reason I, I, I raised that issue is uh, we did that with a huge amount of help from the Iraqis and the Syrians. It was not an American-led ground war as the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was. It was a very different kind of war, which was uh, cyber warfare, drone warfare, U.S. bombing raids and U.S. special forces and special operations forces, and very importantly, building up the Iraqi counterterrorism service. Now, you will recall that in the summer of 2014, the Iraqi army collapsed very ignominiously. Um, well, building up this Iraqi counterterrorism service, I think, was uh, you know, a great success. And that began under the Obama team and, and continued under the Trump team. Uh, and, and that 
the Iraqi counterterrorism service is a elite force that was absolutely essential in defeating ISIS. And then, of course, we did something not dissimilar with the with the Syrian Kurd forces uh, are on the other side of the border. And I, I you know, I give uh, President Obama credit for if the, the, the war against ISIS. And I also give President Trump credit for essentially taking the Obama plan and amping it up. I mean, uh, President Obama had put a number of caveats on um, the number of US forces that could be in Syria. I think he capped it at 500. Uh, there were only three helicopters, American helicopters allowed to go into Syria. Um, President Trump did away with all that. He allowed, and there were up to 2,000 American soldiers in Syria. Uh, there were, uh, you know, that basically there was a, a much less constrained fight against ISIS in Syria. When Trump came in, he also devolved responsibilities essentially from inside the White House down to Central Command um, to make decisions and, and sort of devolve uh, more responsibility down to his commanders. And I was kind of surprised during the election that President Trump didn't uh, talk more about his success against ISIS since he really campaigned to a large degree on the fact that he had a better plan. And he said that he knew more about ISIS than his generals. Uh, you know, that, um, you know, obviously that I don't think was true, but but the point is, is that I don't, he, he strangely didn't make it uh, a much of a, uh, it much of a campaign issue about it uh, because I think it, it is one of his, uh, you know, what it is, it is something that, it worked. By, the, by 2017, 2018, the geographical caliphate, so-called caliphate of ISIS, uh, certainly by 2018, was basically completely gone. Uh, and that, you know, that was important because ISIS could no longer train people for operations in Western Europe. Uh, it meant that ISIS was no longer an attractive place for American citizens to go and uh, join. It meant that uh, no one wanted to like say, hey, I'm part of ISIS. So as you recall, an ISIS-inspired terrorist killed 49 people in a nightclub in Orlando uh, during the run-up to the presidential election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. 14 uh, people were killed in an office in uh, San Bernardino, California by ISIS-inspired terrorists and all that kind of stuff has largely disappeared. Um, and so the kind of geographical caliphate that was destroyed by the actions of Obama and then Trump, I think, was, was certainly uh, a significant uh, success of the Trump administration. Um, and then kind of moving around the globe a little bit, um, I, some other areas which I think were uh, perhaps, and of course, President Trump authorized the operation that killed Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the so-called caliph of the, of the caliphate. Um, so Iran, uh, sort of moving around the, 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 the globe a little bit here, uh, Iran, of course, uh, Trump came into office saying it was the worst deal in history. Uh, that view was not shared by Jim Mattis, who, of course, was his defense secretary, who was asked a very direct question by Senator Angus King, an independent of Maine, uh, in uh, the summer of 2017. Angus King, Senator King asked Jim Mattis, is the Iran nuclear deal in the interest of the United States? And Jim Mattis, who was testifying under oath, said very simply, yes. And there's a, there's a pretty good reason for that. Um, you know, the deal, of course, you know, it could have been better, but all deals could be better. Uh, when we negotiated uh, Soviet uh, nuclear disarmament deals with the Soviets, we didn't say we want you to uh, kind of count the number of missiles you have, the number of nu nuclear missiles. And by the way, we also want to stop all your bad behavior around the world. We had bigger fish to fry, which was the question of nuclear missiles. And the same with the Iran nuclear deal. Yes, we could have put in more kind of caveats about ballistic missile. So we could have said, hey, you know, we don't want you to support Lebanese Hezbollah or whatever. But the point is that that was the best deal we could get. And it actually was working according to, uh, by the time Matt is testified, I think there'd be nine inspections by the, uh, by the kind of uh, the, the inspectorate that's uh, based in Vienna that inspects uh, nuclear, nuclear sites. Uh, and they said it was, the, the deal was working. Um, and, the, and the Iranians were not enriching uranium above the, I think, 3.5% level. Well, of course, there was much debate within the cabinet, within uh, the generals that were in the cabinet about what, what to do about Iran. And I think you know, Jim Mattis was, let's stay in the deal, not only because it was working, but for him, very importantly, it'd be negotiated with our partners over the course of many years, the, particularly the British, the French, and the Germans. And he felt that we'd been, you know, we negotiated this deal in good faith with them and we shouldn't just get out. H.R. McMaster, I think, had a slightly different view, which is let's try and get a better deal, but let's go to the Europeans and put pressure on them to get a, for us to all get a better deal with the Iranians. In the end, uh, that those efforts didn't pan out. Uh, April 2018, H.R. McMaster sort of essentially resigns, is forced out. 
Jim, John Bolton comes in within a month, uh, the United States is pulled out of the deal. Since then, of course, the Iranians have started to enrich uh, their uranium to a higher level. Now they've never approached anything close to what you would need for a nuclear weapon. And you know, we're back in a discussion with them about whether or not we can do another deal. Uh, for them, of course, they, they want to deal very much. The US sanctions against Iran have devastated their economy. Um, the Trump administration obviously uh, came close to the, you know, kind of, I think, to a conflict with them that came, drew back. Uh, you may recall there were drone attacks on Iranian drone attacks on shipping in the, in the Gulf. Uh, Trump didn't respond. Uh, there was an attack on Abu Kek F uh, oil field, which is the biggest oil field uh, in, in the world, the most important uh, oil field in Saudi Arabia. Trump didn't respond to that. And then when an American contractor was killed on an Iraqi base by, by Iranian militia, he did respond and he killed uh, Soleimani, who of course was the leader of the Quds Force. At the time, I, you know, I thought that this would lead, and I and others thought that this would lead to potentially a real conflict with the Iran. It's not necessarily a direct one, but they certainly have proxy forces in Lebanon and uh, Afghanistan and Syria and other places that uh, they can kind of turn on. But clearly they decided they didn't want to confront Trump um, and, and there wasn't a conflict. But I would say that the Iranian, you know, the Trump, or we didn't get anything really from the Iranians uh, under Trump uh, that I think makes us any safer, uh, which raises then the sort of related issue about our Middle East policy. Uh, led by Jared Kushner. You know, I think the Abraham Accords are somewhat useful in the sense that um, they're, they're kind of de, de jure recognition of a de facto situation, which is basically warming relations between the Arab states and Israel, particularly the sort of Gulf states, um, which do now have a you know, kind of common enemy in Iran and you know, basically uh, now you know, have, have, have said, formally kind of created a peace deal with, or, or, or at least it's not a peace deal, but at least some sort of deal that, that brings them closer together, gives them kind of commercial. Uh, there'll be, I think there are already Israeli other flights over to Saudi Arabia. That's uh, discussion, uh, you know, clearly going to, going to be commercial deals between the Emiratis and the Israelis, and this is all good. But I don't think it, it rises to the level of, say, the Camp David Accords. Uh, you know, I, after all, Egypt and Jordan, uh, you know, were really fighting a real war against Israel. Uh, the Emiratis were not, nor were the Saudis. But I don't think it's insignificant. And, and clearly that's all in the context of, of Iran. Um, and again, moving around the globe a little bit um, to China, you know, I think the, the one thing that the Trump people really, I think, got right in a, it, uh, was China. Um, you know, you can disagree on the, on, the, on the details, the kind of brinkmanship on the trade war, that kind of thing. And I, 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 you know, I think some of that was very kind of productive, but I think the, the point that the national defense strategy written by Jim Mattis or overseen by Jim Mattis and also the national security strategy overseen by H.R. McMaster both identify China as a, you know, a kind of stealer of American intellectual property, um, you know, very huge ambitions to turn the South China Sea into a Chinese lake. Uh, the, you know, I think this is all useful. Uh, of course, we don't want to have a, a war with China, but I think certainly there was a lot of wishful thinking around China and that if they open up, that they'll become uh, kind of more liberal if, you know, once we open up more uh, sort of on the, on, the, on, the, on the capitalism side, they'll sort of become more liberal. And of course, that was a pipe dream, didn't happen. They've actually become more authoritarian. And if you listen to Joe Biden's speech last night, I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot of continuity between the Trump team and the Biden team on this. I mean, there's, I think, a, a fair amount of uh, bipartisan consensus on the China issue now. Uh, that um, you know, China is a peer competitor, it doesn't play by uh, fair trade rules, uh, does steal our, our intellectual property, uh, is uh, you know, looking to potentially supplant the United States as the world's superpower. And of course, I I'm not a China expert, and there's a big debate about kind of the extent of what they really want to do. Uh, but the fact is, is that I think that the China policy that the Trump team came up with, I think, uh, in, the, in, the, in the big picture was, was the right approach. Um, and then let me uh, just go back in time a little bit and set the scene of one of my, the first scene in my book is, and, and explain kind of why I wrote about the generals. Um, you know, why did Trump hire all these generals to be, you know, his uh, 
top national security team. Um, and I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a few reasons that, of course, Trump went to a military style boarding school. He's always had sort of a boyish fascination with the military. Did, obviously, he took five deferments in Vietnam, so he had no personal experience with the military, but he, he, he had a sort of fascination with the military. And then rather crucially, the Never Trumper letters really kind of, you know, in a typical administration, like we've just seen with the Biden administration, there are 500 people sitting on the sidelines who, uh, if, if their team wins the election, you know, they've already, you know, they've already served at a fairly high level. They've already, you know, they've already gone, already gone through pretty you know, intense background checks and they're, they're ready to go. Uh, and if Hillary Clinton had won the election against Trump, though, you know, the, the, the transition would have been pretty seamless. Now, because, you know, circa 150 people had so signed these two Never Trumper letters, that was basically much of the Republican establishment. And so those people, I mean, Mike Hayden, for instance, the former director of the CIA, Fran Townsend, who'd served at a, who was kept Bush, uh, George W. Bush's Homeland Security Advisor, you know, at one point she was seriously be considered by Trump as, a, as leading the Department of Homeland Security. In the end, that didn't happen. Uh, but, you know, if you've signed one of these Never Trump letters, it was going to be almost impossible uh, to get a job in the administration. There's only one person, I think, who signed that letter who got a senior job, uh, and, and that was well into the administration. That was Jim Jeffries, who became uh, both the Syria, um, he became essentially the, the leader of the global coalition to defeat ISIS. Uh, at the State Department, he's of course a very well-known and serious diplomat who speaks Turkish and kind of a career diplomat uh, with a lot of experience. But he's the exception that proves the rule. If you'd sign these letters, you basically count yourself out of a job. So that meant that the usual bench of folks was just not available, which meant that the uniformed military, either serving or retired, uh, most of whom uh, would, wouldn't sign this kind of letter, uh, were you know the next kind of group of people that. that that President Trump uh, could look at. And so initially he, he thought about uh, Jack Keane, who uh, I, uh, uh, Jack Keane is a former vice chief of the army, uh, fought in Vietnam, very serious guy. Um, and he acted as it turns out, as I say in my book, as sort of as Trump's kind of shadow national security advisor. Trump went to him first to be the defense secretary, as I report in the book, and he, um, Jack Keane turned it down. His wife had had a very long term terminal illness and she'd recently died and he just couldn't, he couldn't uh, take the job of secretary of defense. Um, and he, but he suggested Jim Mattis. Um, and uh, Jim Mattis was, uh, got the call from Vice President Pence. He was serving at a soup kitchen when he got the call, said, do you mind if I call you back? Called him back um, and, uh, he uh, went to Bedminster, New Jersey, uh, never, had never met Trump, was offered the job. Uh, and of course, John Kelly and Jim Mattis had spent, uh, you knew each other very well. Jim Mattis led the Marines into Baghdad in 2003 as a two-star general. Uh, Jim, uh, John Kelly was his number two, who was promoted uh, during that battle to a one-star general. And there was somebody called Colonel Joe Dunford, uh, who of course then became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs under Trump, who was a colonel as, who was part of that attack on Baghdad. So these guys all knew each other very well. And, and they were sort of, you know, uh, kind of joined at the hip and known each other for uh, a decade and a half when they started working for, uh, for Trump. Uh, and John Kelly uh, also got the call. He had never met Trump. Uh, in fact, he didn't know anybody who knew Trump. And so they came in the administration knowing very little about Trump. Uh, but they were a group of people. And of course, H.R. McMaster was uh, serving in the military. He was a three star. He was in the process of retiring. He gets the call and it's uh, down to him or John Bolton and uh, Trump picks H.R. McMaster, who of course uh, is, is a serving three-star uh, army officer and just there's a salutes and says, yes, I, uh, I'll do the job. And I think H.R. ran a pretty serious process in the, in, the, in the administration. It was a much more regular process. And if you look at, I think the 2017, 2018 timeframe, the Trump administration uh, acted in a much more orderly fashion. Uh, it also, uh, I think achieved more um, and uh, than it did in the, in, the, in the latter years. Now, I finished my book just in kind of closing here. Uh, I, I finished it in October, I think, of 2009. It was published in December of 2009. So, and I concluded that Trump had been very lucky because nothing really bad had happened on his watch. Um, you know, every president going back to FDR has had some major crisis, whether it's, you know, 
Jimmy Carter in Iran or uh, Barack Obama in the financial crisis, uh, George Bush in 9-11, I mean, or Nixon in Vietnam, LBJ in Vietnam, uh, you know, pick your president and usually the president has a major foreign policy crisis, usually it's a foreign policy crisis or some kind of combination of domestic and foreign on, on his watch. Uh, well, when I completed the book, Trump had been very lucky because he got through three years of his presidency and really nothing very big had gone wrong. And then two very big things went wrong at the same time. One, of course, or, or, or one at the same time, but in sequence, one, of course, was COVID. And I think COVID really did not play to Trump's strengths. Um, he he is not uh, anybody, he doesn't do his homework. Um, and uh, a scene in my book is Steve Bannon telling HR and Ralph, so look, basically this is a guy who kind of, you know, doesn't do the homework, uh, comes in, you know, the morning after, you know, being out and, you know, grabs a cup of coffee, looks at your notes and kind of gets a passing grade. And, he, you know, that's just the way he works. Um, Trump also doesn't, ex doesn't trust experts. I mean, I mentioned that he famously said that he knew more, more about ISIS than his generals, which of course made no sense at all. And then also Trump puts a great um, deal of faith in his own gut. And that for that, you know, hydrochloroquine, if you remember that, uh, you know, the flu, it's going to be like the flu, it's going to be over. Uh, and, and Trump, you know, he didn't, so the COVID crisis really uh, played to Trump's weaknesses as, as, a, as a leader. Uh, and then of course you had the protests around George Floyd and as, wrapping up and returning to the generals here, you know, there, there was really, a, I think, a almost a rather profound crisis in civil military relations around the George Floyd protests, because as you recall, President Trump wanted to in, uh, sort of uh, invoke the Insurrection Act. Uh, he wanted to bring out the military in some way to put down these protests. And then there was the famous scene outside uh, the White House as he went to St. John's Church to hold up a Bible in which uh, you know, violent, prote peaceful protesters were violently cleared. This produced a very, very, very strong reaction from the military, unprecedented in my view. Uh, both retired and, 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 and active. So General Milley, who of course is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, two days later publicly apologized in a speech to National Defense University, which of course was on Zoom and saying, this was a big mistake for me to have even been there. Defense Secretary Esper, who was a West Point graduate, uh, also said he would not invoke the, you know, the Insurrection Act would not be invoked and under his watch. Um, and you had this, this, you know, Admiral Mike Mullen, who was the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, come out very strongly against the, uh, this, the peaceful protest being putting down. You had Martin Dempsey, the other former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, also coming out strongly. You had uh, uh, pretty much every, uh, many of the secretaries of defense, including Colin Powell, going back to Colin Powell, but also including Jim Mattis, all really coming out as one to say, you know, that this, 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 using the military and using violence against peaceful protesters was unacceptable. And so, uh, you know, I, I haven't written the paperback version book of this book yet, but clearly um, there is a, there's a big chapter to be done at the end about the, a, the, a, the handling of COVID and B, the way that the military really um, uh, kind of would, wouldn't let stand the idea that the military should be used against peaceful protesters and also that uh, the, the defending the right of peaceful protesters uh, to to protest without violence, and um, and and finally, you know, there's maybe zooming out a little bit. There's a kind of bigger question here about the U.S. military and the and politics in general, and we're entering kind of I think new times. I mean, when President when Admiral Crow endorsed uh, Bill Clinton back in the early '90s, uh, that was kind of unprecedented, and now we're seeing you know, uh, people at pretty high uh, levels, retired three stars and four stars, uh, coming out in favor or against either candidate. And I, I found the, the issue so interesting and so unusual that I, uh, in the last New America, the foundation I looked at, we, we looked at only three stars and four star generals uh, in, in, the, in the Trump administration and their public statements. And we found that 54 came out in support of President Trump and 255 came out against him. The 255 were on issues of leadership, 158 civil rights and foreign policy, 33. Uh, and this is kind of an unprecedented, and, and whatever your views about President Trump and whatever you, you, 
we're entering a, a kind of new phase where the military is, uh, retired military uh, is taking uh, more politicized positions. Um, and, um, you know, that, that, that comes with its own issues, um, whatever your political views. So you could imagine a President Harris or a President, you know, pick your, or, or President Rubio, um, and the military again taking positions uh, publicly. And when I say the military, I mean retired uh, three stars and four stars. And the reason I talk about three stars and four stars is because they're the, the real uh, leaders of the military. And, and in a sense, what a one star or a two star retired says is less important. But when a Mike Mullen comes out or a Martin Dempsey or a Colin Powell, it has a very different kind of uh, effect, I think. Anyway, so um, I'll take questions should you have them. Hi, Peter, thank you so very much. Um, this was such an excellent presentation um, and discussion and I learned so many things um, that <laughs> I didn't know um, about the consistency across presidencies in terms of dealing with the Middle East, which seems to be a very consistent problem. They, they, maybe it, some of it's cultural. I, I just don't. I think the it's so different than what people expect in the United States. They just sort of don't know what to do with, it, you know, with the information or how to understand what actually is happening over there. Or, and and I don't know how we can how we can build that bridge to help the American people understand more about what's going on. It, I, I was fascinated to see that they um, were similar, that three presidencies were similar. Well, I mean, at least on this, on the counterterrorism issue, very much so, because I mean, it, it, it's, it's a policy that works and it doesn't involve large numbers of American boots on the ground and it's effective. And that's why it's so puzzling, you know, you know that Biden is putting the plug on Afghanistan. But I will say one thing about the Middle East in general, which is, you know, you know, Lenin has this great, I think, it's, I think it's Lenin who said, you know, you may not have an interest in war, but war has an interest in you. Um, and I, I think that um, the Middle East is one of those places where the United States always wants to turn off the switch and say, hey, it's complicated. These people have been killing each other for a long time and we're just not interested. Uh, but we keep getting sucked back into it. Every president, you know, Jimmy Carter, uh, Ronald Reagan with Iran-Contra, um, you know, of course, George W. Bush, George H.W. Bush with Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, Clinton with Al Qaeda rising on his watch. You know, it just, we want to turn it off because it's complicated, but, you know, it, but it, it, it rarely happens that we can just sort of say, you know, I think the one, you know, there was a great headline when President Biden, Vice President Biden and Tony Blinken negotiated this Iran pullout. It was in Reuters. And it said, you know, America pulls troops out of Iraq, war over. <laughs> like, the absence of American troops doesn't equal peace. Um, and, you know, both the left and the right, and I'm going to say the right sort of Trumpian wing of the Republican Party, uh, I think kind of confuse our absence as being kind of something, somehow peace will break out. And, you know, I, if you look at the history of South Korea, we have 28,000 troops in South Korea today. And we've been there for seven decades. And you know, South Korea at the end of the, North, the Korean War was the poorest country in the world. Now it's one of the richest. And these changes didn't happen overnight. You know, it was an authoritarian democracy, military junta. Uh, you know, things take time. Uh, but the point, the larger point is, is that just just because we're tired of something and we pull out doesn't mean that you know we're going to get what we want. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting point. So we've got a couple of good questions here. One is, what are the formal constraints that exist to the um, politicization of the military? Are there any constraints? Well, I mean, there, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are two constraints. One is, you know, the military sees itself and is a very apolitical organization. And I, you know, I, but I mean, of course, the military is a reflection of American society. And so just as American society is pretty split about uh, politics right now, you'd be, you know, it would be naive to think that the military isn't, but they try not to let that interfere in their, you know, in, in their daily life. And I, you know, the serving military is very careful about these issues, but there's been kind of a norm uh, 
and, and norms, I think, you know, one of the things that I think the interesting thing about the Trump administration is the extent to which we didn't realize we had an unwritten constitution. You know, the United, United Kingdom has an unwritten constitution, and we all know that. But it turns out the American, the United States has a written constitution and an unwritten one. But one of the um, part of the unwritten constitutions is the norms around the behaviors of uh, retired military officers, which is that never to engage in politics. You know, Mike Flynn, of course, you know, was leading trials of locker up during the Trump uh, convention. Um, and, and, you know, his fellow, his peers were horrified by that. Um, but, you know, at the same time, Gen uh, General Allen, who's a four-star retired Marine general, gave a stem-winding speech in support of Hillary Clinton during her convention. Now, he wasn't calling, uh, he wasn't leading cheer, you know, calls to lock Trump up or anything like that. But the point is, is that a norm has changed. And that may reflect the increasing politicization of American, pol American uh, society. And, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting, we're seeing the development of what you, I think, what political scientists would call political sectarianism, which is, you know, similar to kind of, it's not the Shia and the Sunni in Iraq, but it is. It has a sort of flavor that is that is almost theological, and there's a very much a we and they, and and there's very little kind of commonality, unfortunately. Um, and so, yes, the military is surely affected by that. Of course, in its day-to-day -day operations, it's very careful not to be. But the norm of retired military not engaging in politics, I think, you know, we've seen that norm disappear. You know, there's a lot of societal norms that seem to be changing these days. So um, another question is, is you hear a lot about war profiteering. Um, can you explain a little bit about how that works and does it generate revenue and from whom? Well, you know, wars are good for Washington and wars are, uh, you know, they're, they're Keynesian uh, in a sense, right? Because we spend a lot of money on stuff that's usually ours. And so when I hear we spent $6 trillion on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, that may be true, and of course, it includes future healthcare costs and other. But let's say that number is correct, it's a Brown University number. You know, what's slightly misleading about that is most of that money is spent on ourselves. I mean, it's spent on American contractors, the salaries of America. It's not like we're giving this money to the Afghans or the Iraqis. Certainly, some of that money disappeared in corrupt pockets in Afghanistan and Iraq. But the vast majority of, money, of that money is going to ourselves. And so, war profiteering is obviously kind of a loaded phrase, but I mean, I, you have to, you have to check me on this, but there's a really interesting data point that demonstrates what this what this how this works, which is I think in 2001 before 9/11, one of the of the 10 richest counties in the United States, one was in the Washington D.C. area. I think if you fast forward 10 years, I think five out of 10 were in the D.C. area. So wars tend to be good, good for Washington. Um, they bring uh, a lot of money. Uh, and I mean, and that's not why war was, I'm not suggesting that wars are fought for these reasons, but the fact is, is that uh, w there is a kind of, you know, war economy, uh, which tends to benefit uh, the Washington DC larger region uh, for obvious reasons, because that's where the national security apparatus is, that's where the Pentagon is, and that's where the intelligence community is. Just think about the intelligence community budget. It went from, I think, 20, million, 20, 20 billion on 9-11 to about 70 billion today. Just think about the, D, the DHS. It's the largest organization outside the Pentagon in the federal government. It didn't exist before 9-11. Just think about the Transportation Safety Administration. It didn't exist before 9-11. Think about the National Counterterrorism Center. It didn't exist before 9-11. So, I mean, you have this, any, you kind of have this, you know, large kind of bureaucratic apparatus that builds up uh, and I, when I say this, I'm not making a, this is not really a criticism, it's an observation um, that, that happens. So are these people war profiteers? I mean, that's a very low, I mean, is, or is it more that when a war happens, whatever its kind of complexion, uh, it's going to have a sort of Keynesian stimulant effect on certain parts of the American domestic economy uh, that's involved in that conflict. Okay, no, that's that's really interesting, and you're absolutely, I mean, I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I think, you know, it really is fascinating to think about how much of that money actually supports the U.S. economy, you know, in terms of... You could supposed to make the argument that it should, you know, it could be that the bang for the buck would be much greater if we fixed, you know, our roads and airports and blah, 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 but the fact is, is that it, it it's not like we're just spending that money over there. It, a lot of it comes back here. Yeah. 
Okay, no, that's that's great information. So, um, some Christopher Murphy has asked: Is it conceivable that the U.S. has done a back-channel deal with Pakistan that incentivizes Pakistan to prevent the Taliban from overrunning Kabul? And are there financial aid involved? I don't think so. I mean, our relations with the Pakistanis are pretty contentious, and I don't. I mean, I don't think the Pakistanis want Afghanistan to turn into a huge civil war with the Taliban. What they don't, I mean, they, they, they've, they've been very consistent. They just want a, a, a Afghanistan that is not pro-India. That's all they really care about. And of course the president, the, the Afghan government, generally speaking, is pro-India because <laughs> they're anti-Pakistan. So, you know, it's kind of a, uh, but you know, what the Pakistanis had their own Pakistani Taliban who killed tens of thousands of Pakistanis. They themselves had a huge military operation to basically expel the Pakistani Taliban who then went into Afghanistan. So it's not, I mean, it's a very complicated question, but the, Pak the Pakistanis um, don't want an Afghanistan that just descends into the civil war that existed in the 90s. The present civil war is like a croquet match by comparison, because that will blow back on them. And they have their own issues with the Taliban. But they, on the other hand, they don't want an Afghan government that's sort of aligned with India. Uh, and they want, you know, and so they want their people that sort of more or less follow their point of view um, and and they, it's a complicated policy that they're following, but that that's their policy. Okay, no, it's fascinating, fascinating. Okay, we have another question about, this one's about Syria. So how is Syria figuring into this whole Middle East picture? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have a good answer to it. I mean, I don't think, as far as I know, Biden hasn't appointed a Syria envoy, I don't think. Um, I could be wrong. I don't see a lot of diplomatic activity. Uh, I, I don't. I haven't really recalled President Biden talking about Bashir al-Assad. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I don't know what's. I don't know what's happening. Uh, I mean, Assad seems to have won the war more or less. We, on the other hand, have mostly extirpated ISIS. Um, but it's a very good question. I don't have a good answer to. Yeah, it's gonna. It's gonna be interesting interesting to see how it unfolds. Um, so, and then we have another question that says, where do the terrorist groups get their money? Where do they get their funding from? You know, terrorists are volunteers. Um, I mean, if you're a suicide attacker, um, you're not gonna be influenced by money. Um, I, I would make a distinction between a terrorist group and a sort of insurgent group. And now ISIS kind of, kind of combined, but it was both an insurgent army and it had people on the payroll and then it had people volunteering it. After all, 40,000 Muslims from around the world volunteered to join ISIS. And they were probably paid a, you know, a little bit of money, but it was, you know, they, came, they left very comfortable homes in France and Germany to live in Syria. Um, and that, that was really about you know, joining the movement and, and kind of ideology. So I, a group like Al Qaeda is very small uh, and, and those people are volunteers, many of them from upper middle class or middle class families. Mohammed Atta, the leader of the 9-11 attackers, after all had a PhD from a German university. He, his father was a lawyer in Egypt. I mean, he came from the upper middle class. And of course, Bin Laden himself came, his father was one of the richest men in the Middle East. And he himself graduated from the best university in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, money is important for insurgent groups. So groups like the Taliban have people on the payroll because they have 30,000 Man, people in their army. And similarly with ISIS, when it was operating as an army, it had people on the payroll. But when you're looking at terrorist groups like the Bader Meinhof gang in the 70s in Germany, uh, or, or Al Qaeda on 9 11, or you know, these groups are, are made up of volunteers, many from the middle class or upper middle class, who, don't, who aren't in it for the money and who, are, who, or who just are true believers. Yeah, so. Um... Yeah, that's just really fascinating. So what motivates them to be volunteers? Is it, I mean, I mean we, we don't have any idea? <laughs> you know, there's a whole raft of academic literature about this, which I won't bore you with. But I mean, you know, I mean, there's a whole, there's a, there's a wonderful observation by the philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, from the Crooked Timber of Humanity, not a straight thing is made. And I think that's a very useful observation because what there's no like single answer to your question well i mean because we're all complicated and we're all why do we do some sometimes we don't even understand why the things we do ourselves let alone why other people do them 
And so joining a group dedicated to killing innocent civilians is, you know, it's just a pretty strange decision, but it, it, it's often uh, death of a family member may take you down a road of radicalization. Now, most people, you know, many, uh, Greg Sadoff works with the, the, the FBI and the, the, you know, the FBI behavioral unit is very interested in why, you know, how do people radicalize and why? And, and, and there's something called the path to violence. And if you're a kind of basically a, somebody who's gonna carry out a violent act, you do a set of things. It doesn't matter what your ideology is. You, first of all, you, know, you think to yourself, I don't like my wife's cooking. And then you say, well, you know, what if I got rid of my wife? And then you start researching ways to get rid of her. And then you start maybe doing rehearsals and then you do the thing. So whether, whether you're just somebody who wants to kill your wife or you're somebody who, who carries out an act of terrorist violence, you do the same set of things. Your actions are the same. And so the FBI tries to get away from the question of ideology uh, because being a radical in this country, for instance, is not a crime. And it's more interested in what your actions are because the actions of somebody who's going to carry out an act of violence are actually very similar, whatever the ideology or motivation. And so the answer to your question about why people join these groups is, you know, it can be, uh, I, lo I lost my job. You know, I feel that Muslims are under attack. You know, I, I get more interested in my religion. Or if you're a right-wing extremist, of course, we've had plenty of that in this country. Uh, you know, Timothy McVeigh, who killed 168 people at the Oklahoma Federal City, uh, a federal building in Oklahoma City, you know, he, had, he was kind of drifting in life and kind of attached himself to the Michigan militia. He was influenced by a book by um, a book called The Turner Diaries. And, but ultimately, you know, you, I, I can tell you kind of a lot about what these guys, the typically guys, you know, who they are, where they came from. But when you actually come down to the question of why, the really big why, you, you, the actually really uncomfortable answer is there really, really is no good reason. If you ask Jahar Sanya, if you killed a, an eight-year-old boy at the Boston Marathon, why did you do it with those bombs? He wouldn't have a good answer. He'd say, well, Muslims are under attack. You know, it would be a very superficial answer. And I think that is really the point uh, the and uh, you know, and, and on a more philosophical level, we have a great need to know why. But the uncomfortable answer is there may not be a good answer. There is a small library of books about Hitler and the Holocaust, all of which try to answer that question in one way or another. But ultimately, it's not answerable. Why did he destroy much of Europe, and why did he try and, and almost succeed in you know getting rid of uh, every Jew in Europe? Um, there is really no good answer to that. And that gets to the nature of evil, which is ultimately it's mysterious. All right, Peter, you, you're so insightful. And this is just wonderful. So we have um, um, one last question and that is, um, have you got an, uh, are you working on another book? Yeah, it relates to this question, which I'm, I'm doing a book called The Rise and Fall of Osama Bin Laden. And I'm trying to sort out, you know, kind of the why question. But certainly I've got lots of answers for how he radicalized. But why he became the person he did become is, 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 is an interesting and rather complicated question. Uh, I think I produced about as good an answer as I can get, as I can give, uh, but it doesn't mean that I fully answer the question. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It has been absolutely fascinating. I have learned so many things. Um, and I, I think we've gotten most of the questions answered. Um, there was, um, one last question that said, do you think Trump's going to run again? I don't know. You don't know. All right. So, but thank you so much for your time. We look forward to seeing you in August. Um, we hope maybe you'll be able to come in person as well. Um, mm -hmm. And we can do it both virtually and, and live. So thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Pranit. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye.